Thank you, Melanie. It's great to be here tonight uh, with all of you. And I look forward to talking about the connection between marriage uh, and social justice. And of course, as all of us, I think, are aware in the last, uh, really the last five years or so, there's been a kind of renaissance of concern about social justice. And certainly one of the foremost proponents of a kind of uh, public and indeed, a, obviously, a Christian ethic of social justice has been our own Pope. Uh, Francis, who's been weighing in on questions of inequality, for instance, as this quote here uh, suggests. So he says that growth and justice requires more than economic growth. It requires decisions, programs, mechanisms, and processes specifically geared to a better distribution of income, the creation of sources of employment, and an integral promotion of the poor, which goes beyond a simple welfare mentality. He's also, again, spoken up um, in a defense of sort of the classic uh, Christian concern for both the liberation and the promotion of the poor and for enabling them to be fully a part of our society. And he's also, in the context of this kind of social justice vision, talked about the importance of serving the vulnerable, of protecting people, showing loving concern for each and every person, especially children, the elderly, those in need, were often the last we think about. And for his witness, he has gotten, obviously, considerable recognition around the globe and then closer uh, here at home. So when Pope uh, Francis visited the White House uh, just uh, last month, um, President Obama had this to say about him, saying that you remind us that in the eyes of God, our measure as individuals and our measure as a society is not determined by wealth or power or station or celebrity, but by how well we hew to scriptures call to lift up the poor and the marginalized to stand up for justice and against inequality and to ensure that every human being is able to live in dignity because we are all made in the image of God." Unquote. So these obviously these quotes give you a sense of the ways in which social justice has kind of come to the fore um, in recent years. But I think that this new attention devoted in many quarters really to questions of inequality, to questions of poverty, and to social justice more generally or more broadly, has often not factored in the ways in which a retreat from marriage, a retreat from marriage here in the United States is a cause in part of the growing economic divide uh, found throughout much of America and also the divide that's impacting um, our nation's children in a particularly profound way. So just to kind of give you a sense of sort of how this growing marriage divide this growing marriage inequality in the U.S. is sort of uh, unfolding in our country. I want to say that I think really both the U.S. and the West more generally is increasingly separate and unequal when it comes to marriage. We are seeing a world where the college educated in our midst are doing relatively well by marriage. Uh, they're enjoying comparatively high quality marriages um, and comparatively low levels of divorce. By contrast, less educated Americans, working class and poor Americans are today less likely to form and sustain high quality marriages and their kids are more likely to be exposed to family instability and to single parenthood. So again, we're seeing a kind of a growing class divide in marriage in America. And these next three slides give you a sense of what this looks like in real terms. So we see here, for instance, um, in the high educated are those who are college educated, those in the middle are those high school degree or some college, and those on the left are those who are high school dropouts. What we see here basically is that divorce is much less common among Americans who have a college degree. That's the set of bars on the right, and it's come down, um, you know, since the 70s and 80s uh, for this particular group of folks. By contrast, divorce is much more common among Americans who have a high school degree or some college. In the middle here. And it's also obviously quite common among those Americans on the left who are high school dropouts. And you might take some kind of false comfort from this, the drop in divorce for the far left group here. Um, but you really shouldn't, because what's actually happening for this group of folks over here is they're just not getting married much anymore. So the folks who actually do go ahead and get married are enjoying relatively more stability than their, uh, their predecessors back in the 1970s and, uh, and early 80s. But really, I think probably the more profound reality today is not divorce, which was kind of the big concern that I had when I entered my graduate studies at Princeton back in the 1990s. 
um, it's really this. This is really the, the primary sort of engine of family instability now in our country, and that is non-marital childbearing. People having kids, usually in cohabiting unions. Um, and what you can see here is that this, this pattern of having kids outside of marriage is now um, quite common among less educated Americans. So it's really only among the college educated set right here that we see folks really connecting marriage and parenthood in a, in a, in a powerful and important way. By contrast, we're seeing is that Americans kind of in the lower middle class, working class and among the poor, um, using education as a proxy for those class um, indicators are having kids outside of marriage at a high rate. Yes, sir. So again, so yeah, this is, these are folks who have a college degree. So these women have a college degree. These women have a high school degree or some college, and these women are high school dropouts, okay? And you can see this is where kind of the, the biggest change has happened in the last you know, 20 uh, or 30 years, that this sort of middle group, lower middle class, working class group has become much more like this group in its approach to having kids. Um, and this divide has, has really opened up between the college educated set and this other set. And then just approximately what part of the population each of those three groups? Uh, this is about one third of the population, about uh, one half, and then this would be the remainder. So, yeah. So this is really a, a pretty substantial portion of our, uh, of our population here in the US. Now for me, all this matters really ultimately because kids are affected uh, by this. And the next slide gives you a sense of how this is playing out for uh, for children. And what we can see here is that for um, kids whose moms have a high school degree or less, a pretty linear increase in living in a single parent household here uh, in the US. By contrast, for kids whose moms have a bachelor's degree or more who are college educated, we see not just actually kind of a flattening, but actually a decline in the share of kids in college-educated homes who are living um, in, in single-parent homes. So again, college-educated Americans have kind of figured a lot of this stuff out here when it comes to marriage, childbearing, and divorce. Unfortunately, as this you know, slide I think here suggests, everyone else has not figured things out, and their kids are paying a price for um, you know, this growing marriage divide uh, in America. So the bottom line here is that the U.S. is in danger, quote, of devolving into a separate and an equal family regime where the highly educated and the affluent enjoy strong and stable households and everyone else is consigned to increasingly unstable, unhappy, and unworkable ones. So how does this matter for our kids? Um, and, and why does it matter for our kids that this is kind of unfolding uh, this retreat for marriage is unfolding uh, in the U.S. So, of course, one consequence here is that more kids are experiencing time in a single-parent family. And there's certainly some, I think, portions of our culture would sort of say, well, the family is just changing. It's not under duress. It's not declining. It's not threatened. It's just simply changing. Um, and I think the problem with that perspective is it doesn't really grapple with the science about kids and marriage and family. And what we know is that kids who are reared, in, for instance, single parent families are about two to three times more likely to experience serious negative outcomes like delinquency or depression um, compared to their peers who are raised in intact married families. Now, as these numbers here suggest to you, I'm not saying that every child raised in an intact married family turns out perfectly, they don't obviously, um, or that every kid who's raised in a single parent family turns out poorly. Most kids, as this slide here suggests to you, turn out fine. I was raised by a single mom, I think that both my sister and I have turned out pretty well as adults. We're happily married, we have actually between us 12 kids and you know, so there's, uh, um, we've kind of in a sense dodged the bullet, if you will. But what you can see also here is that kids who are born into or raised in single parent families are more likely, you know, they're about two and a half times, three times more likely to experience serious illness. And communities and neighborhoods that have lots of single parent families pay a price in terms of the quality of their schools, 
the safety of their neighborhoods, et cetera, when there are lots of single parent families in a given neighborhood, town, city, state, or, uh, or country. Well, like a, a pattern of delinquency as a teenager, um, being, you know, facing clinical depression, um, having a teenage pregnancy, things like that. Yeah. Well, that would be, and I'm talking here as sort of in, in, in their childhood years, not, in, not into their young adult or adult years, yeah. So we see that obviously these kinds of outcomes are more common among kids who've been raised in a single parent household. Again, things like drug use, uh, things like teen pregnancy, um, and things like child poverty. But to kind of give you a, a clearer sense of what it is I'm talking about here, um, you know, we've been talking a lot lately about incarceration in this country. Uh, one thing that hasn't come up that often, though, is that there's a real family structure component to this. And that is the boys who are raised in a single mother household compared to an intact married household with their father in the home are more than twice as likely to end up in prison or in jail by the time they turn 30 um, compared to kids raised with their married mother and father right here. And this is controlling for differences in parental education, in race, ethnicity, um, and household income. So there's a very strong connection here. And the idea, of course, is that having a father in the household who can provide some you know, direction, stability, discipline, can monitor you know, a, a boy's peers, um, all that helps keep uh, our teenage boys, our young men, kind of on the straight and narrow path. That's sort of the, the takeaway, I would say, from this, uh, this particular s slide. But dads matter for daughters as well, as this slide here also suggests. So what we see um, here actually, and this, this is a little bit mislabeled, this should be that the red's actually when dad left between zero and five, and the green is when dad left between six and 18. So in other words, when dad leaves earlier in his daughter's life, she's much more likely to end up pregnant as a teenager um, compared to when dad is there for the duration of her childhood. So having his attention, his affection, um, and not seeking it from a teenage boy or young man who doesn't have her best interest at heart, um, having him in the picture kind of monitoring her boyfriends or the men coming through the household, um, having her mother and father model a respectful and loving relationship between one another, you know, setting up a good template for her, what she's looking for you know, in a boyfriend and later in a husband, all helps girls in these intact families typically kind of avoid um, you know, sex and avoid uh, having a teenage uh, pregnancy. And then kind of in a more positive light or, or turning to kind of a more positive outcome, we know that we live in a world where human capital um, is really important for flourishing in today's contemporary marketplace. And we see uh, in the data is that kids from both better educated homes on the right and less educated homes on the left, kids in blue who are coming from intact families are more likely to attend and graduate from college compared to their peers who are coming from non-intact families. Um, and then as we kind of go into adulthood, we know too that young adults, in this case those who are aged 28 to 30, are more likely to be working more hours and, and actually be gainfully employed if they're coming from an intact family on the left here um, than a step family or a single parent family. So I'm giving you a series of slides that give you some idea of how kind of single parenthood plays out. But I wanna turn more directly now to thinking about divorce, which has been getting a lot of attention lately, both in the church and in the press more generally. Um, and the first thing I wanna sort of, sort of touch upon is this question of sort of conflict. And what we see in the research is that for kids who are in highly conflict uh, or highly conflicted marriages, where there might be physical violence, for instance, where there might be regular screaming fits between husband and wife, you know, their plates flying through the air maybe on Saturday night, for instance, in those kinds of marriages, it looks like for the sake of the kids, it's best for the parents to, to part ways. Um, by contrast, when kids are in a low conflict marriage, where one spouse is kind of maybe drifting away from the other spouse, um, one spouse maybe feels unhappy or unfulfilled 
um, is looking for a new start, or one spouse has an affair. Um, in those lower conflict situations, it looks like um, the divorce is worse for the kids. That is, they're more likely to take a pretty big social and emotional hit from having their parents get divorced in that kind of context. And I think the story here is that in a lower conflict marriage, when divorce happens, the kids are more likely to be surprised by that and disoriented by that. They didn't really see it coming. They didn't really expect it. And it can shake their faith in their parents, in love, and in marriage, uh, more particularly down the road. And the unfortunate reality is that today about two-thirds of divorces involving kids in the country are these low-conflict um, marriages, where if the parents were kind of putting their kids' interests first, um, they would not go ahead and get divorced. I've also been talking a lot lately about this question of divorce and remarriage. And so I have a colleague, Nicholas Zill, who's a psychologist, um, who's been doing some analyses for uh, the Institute for Family Studies, with which I'm also affiliated. And uh, as I was telling uh, Father, uh, these are literally just, <laughs> just sort of off the boat, if you will. I got them um, en route from uh, Charlottesville to, uh, to Alexandria and just <laughs> threw them on to the, to, the, uh, to the slides up here. But what's interesting about this set of findings is that uh, what they're doing in this, na it's, a, it's a nationally representative survey of kids in schools across the U.S. And what you can see here is that um, kids, particularly in fifth grade, whose parents have gotten divorced, um, are more likely to say that they're sad, or so that the teachers are more likely to describe them as being sad, worried, or withdrawn. And that pattern is sort of most pronounced among fifth graders whose parents have gotten divorced and then remarried. So something about that kind of transition from, you know, from the first marriage to the divorce to the remarriage seems to be more challenging for kids based, again, on teacher reports of kids' behavior. So it's a pretty good estimation. We're not relying on parents' reports. We're relying upon teachers' reports of these kids uh, in school. And then, again, looking at school suspensions for kids, um, up through, uh, uh, up through fifth grade, what we can see here is that um, both in the observed bars, which is sort of just what we see without any controls, and the red bars, where they're controlling for factors like parental education, race and ethnicity and income, there's a pretty linear association between um, divorce and then remarriage and having more reports of school suspensions for kids. So these slides are not in any way definitive, but they are suggestive that there may be some ways in which, you know, insofar as kids thrive on stable routines and stable caregivers, the experience versus divorce, but then again, of a new transition into a step family can be challenging for kids um, on these outcomes among others. But I mentioned at the beginning of, of my talk tonight that when I started at Princeton, I was thinking more about this question of divorce. Um, and today, um, what we're seeing is that kids are more likely to experience a cohabitation um, than a parental divorce. And in particular, we think about, you know, 41, 42, 43 percent of kids will experience a cohabitation. Either their parents are cohabiting at birth, or in the wake of a breakup, mom or dad will be cohabiting with someone. And, you know, one might think that you got two adults, you know, it's, it's a pretty good thing. Um, but what's interesting is that the sort of the outcomes for kids in cohabiting relationships look very similar to outcomes for kids in single parent relationships. Um, when it comes to like um, drug use, uh, dropping out of high school, or having serious emotional problems, kids who are in cohabiting households tend to do worse than these types of outcomes. And there's one outcome where kids in cohabiting households do worse than kids in stable single parent households, and in, in a pretty profound way. Before we go there, can you guess what I'm, what I'm heading towards? What, what do you think I'm gonna hit? Um, probably abuse. You're right, abuse, That's, uh, that is correct. So when it comes to the physical abuse of children, the sexual abuse of children,
the emotional abuse of children. What we see is that kids who are in cohabiting households with an unrelated adult, so usually a biological mother and an unrelated male, um, they are much more likely to be physically, sexually, and emotionally abused. That's the tall bar here in the middle of these three outcomes. And this comes from the federal report, the fourth national instant study of child abuse and neglect um, that is produced just across the river by the US Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, what's also interesting though about this particular uh, figure is, you can't really see the colors as well as I'd like you to, but what's the gold standard here? Yeah, the intact married biological family is literally the gold standard in this, and it's not my colors, it's the Fed's colors. You know, but they colored the intact bio married family in gold in this report um, for the federal government. And that's the safest place uh, in America for uh, right there, right there, and right there. Um, that's literally kind of the place where our kids are the least likely um, to be uh, physically, sexually, or emotionally abused. And why is it that cohabitation is risky for kids? Well, the way I think we can think about it is that cohabitation allows for, um, and is attractive to many young adults today because it allows for kind of a freedom and flexibility, not having to kind of be that committed to someone. But the flip side of that, of course, for kids is that the adults have less commitment between one another. There's less trust because there's less commitment. There's less sexual fidelity. There's more violence. And there's less parental supportiveness um, typically given to kids in that context than they would find in a married, more stable, committed uh, relationship. And the metal bleeds into more instability. So if you have had kids, if you've taught kids, if you've cared for kids, you know they thrive on stable routines with stable caregivers. And that's not what they tend to get in a cohabiting household. Okay, they get a lot of instability, which is often challenging for them, but also can put them at risk too, because if their household is chaotic, they're more likely to be a target for someone who senses their vulnerability and then you know, targets them for, uh, for something like what we saw in the last the last of the slides. And this slide here gives you a sense of the instability we're talking about. So kids who are born to cohabiting parents um, are about three times more likely to see mom and dad part ways by the time they turn five compared to kids born to married parents. Yes, sir? Are these statistics for all This is for everyone. And so if you were to control, again, here for race, this, this one actually is not controlled for. If you're controlled for race, ethnicity, education, it's about a doubling of risk for cohabitation. This is just what you would find in the population at large on average for this particular slide. Now, in terms of kind of making sense of what I've been suggesting about kind of the connection between a stable marriage and the welfare of kids, uh, what I would say is that an intact marriage increases the economic resources um, that are available to kids. Uh, married parents tend to obviously pool their income, they tend to save more, they tend to get support financially from both sets of kin more readily than even comparable um, cohabiting uh, parents. The second point to make here is they tend to enjoy more stable routines, um, kids have more stable caregivers, and they're more likely to stay in one neighborhood over time, and that's all good for, uh, good for kids. The third point that I would make is that married parents in their, you know, in their first marriage tend to provide more consistent attention and affection and discipline uh, to their kids than do single parents or step parents. And the fourth point to make here in all this is that biological relatedness seems to matter, that having some kind of, of connection to your kids biologically um, seems to foster a sense of identity with them and to protect um, kids from, again, from, uh, from abuse. And these ideas, I think, are well articulated. The next quote, which comes from my advisor, Princeton Sarah McClanahan, and her colleague Gary Sandifer, they wrote a book for Harvard in 1994, kind of reflecting on their work on child well-being and family structure. 
And it's also important to note that Sarah McClanahan was uh, herself a single mother. Uh, she'd gotten divorced in the 70s, um, then when she got remarried, had three kids. So she experienced a lot of all this, you know, um, up close and personal. But as a scholar, again, as a scholar, she said this, if we were asked to design a system for making sure that children's basic needs were met, we'd probably come up with something quite similar to the two-parent ideal. Such a design in theory would not only ensure that children had access to the time and money of two adults, it would also promote a system of checks and balances that promote equality parenting. The fact that both parents have a biological connection to the child would increase the likelihood that the parents would identify with the child and be willing to sacrifice for that child, and it would reduce the likelihood that either parent would abuse the child. Okay, so a pretty, I think, clear articulation, again, of this idea that both marriage matters and that a kind of biological connection to the child matters. And that's why having an intact married family tends to be better for kids, again, on average. We all know that there are exceptions here, but I'm saying sort of this is sort of the average story that we would see um, playing out here in the U.S. Do you, do you consider a stay-at-home mother or stay-at-home father? And there seems to be this pooling aspect of two incomes. Right. Um, I've read studies that say a stay-at-home parent is more effective for children than the increased income from two-parent income. So yeah, I, let me come back to that after. But yeah, so I'm talking here really more about, I mean, even when you have one parent at home, again, you often will have, you know, kin who are helping out financially in some way. So you could have, you know, the wife's parents who maybe are helping out with, you know, the kid's soccer costs or tutoring or whatnot because, you know, their, their daughter is married to their son-in-law and they're all, you know, completely on board with what's happening in the family. Um, but I'll come back to that question, though, more particularly at, at the end. We have time for Q&A at the yeah. end as well. Sure. So the other point that I want to make too, in terms of talking about kind of individual outcomes for, for kids is that kind of what I've been talking about in terms of how kids are more likely to be facing single parent families, step families, cohabitation, family instability, again, is, is not happening kind of across the board. It's really quite what we call stratified in sociology. That is that, again, kids who are coming from poor working class homes are much more likely to be experiencing all of this. That means that they're basically being left doubly disadvantaged. Their parents have fewer social and economic resources to begin with, typically. And in addition to that, they're less likely to be raised in an intact married home. So they're getting less stability, less consistent affection and attention, and less consistent discipline, you know, beyond just kind of the material situation that their parents might have been in to start with. Okay, so in some important respect, this retreat from marriage is hitting our poor and working class kids obviously <coughs> particularly hard. So the other thing that I want to say tonight before I conclude is that we need to think about marriage and family and or, or not just about in terms of how it affects individual kids but how it affects the larger social environment. Um, and the point I would make here is that when the family breaks down we see some pretty important um, communal consequences, both for cities and towns, for states, and for the country um, at large. So if you take something like poverty, for instance, uh, we've seen a pretty marked increase in child poverty since the late 1960s, and par that's partly a, a consequence of the retreat from marriage. The fact that fewer families are headed by two parents who could be pooling income or drawing you know, on assets from a variety of sources um, and single parents are less able to, to bring as many financial resources to the table. And so in the words of uh, Bell Sahel at Brookings, quote, with some exceptions, the studies generally find that most, and in some cases all of the increases in child poverty over the past 30 to 40 years, can be explained by changes in family structure. So in other words, the fact that more and more families are headed by single parent families is one big reason why we've seen an increase in child poverty in the U.S since the late 1960s. And then last week, with two colleagues, we did a study of, among other things, child poverty at the state level. And we wanted to sort of see what's the connection between having strong families in a given state um, and the risk of child poverty being higher at the state level um, in that state. And what we found, not surprisingly, is that 
states where the family is comparatively weak. That's states like New Mexico, Louisiana, and South Carolina here at the top of this particular slide have much higher rates of child poverty than states like um, North Dakota, New Hampshire, and Minnesota where um, kids are much more likely to be living in married parent families. Now there are exceptions here to the rule, so Maryland actually does fairly well even though it's not greater than married parent front because it's comparatively highly educated. Um, but the point I'm making here is that on average, what we see is that child poverty is typically lower in a state when there are more married parent families in that state. Okay? So again, there's a connection between what's happening in our homes um, and what's happening in the state in terms of something like child poverty. Yeah, we control for, you know, I mean, our models control for, again, at the state level, race, uh, college educations, um, state spending on education, infrastructure, things like that, so. Um, we did not, but there certainly is a religion story here. So, um, Utah is number one. It, it's the most religious state in the country, um, and they have the highest levels of married parenthood. So that's, you know, that's part of the story here. And, and more generally, the kind of the northern plain states like Nebraska um, and the Dakotas do pretty well. And I think part of that's just kind of a cultural story that's both kind of somewhat more religious but also more culturally conservative than other parts of the country. We've also obviously been talking a lot about you know, income inequality in the country um, in recent years. And what hasn't, again, has gotten as much attention is that there's a strong connection between growing inequality and the retreat from marriage. In fact, Molly Martin, who's a professor at Penn State, found that about 41% of the increase in family income inequality between 1976 and 2000 can be linked to this shift in family structure that I'm talking about. And that is, is that, again, less educated Americans are now more likely to be experiencing family instability and single parenthood and that reduces their income, other things being equal, even as the better educated set have actually seen their marriages become more stable, which of course increases their income, right? So again, part of the story here is that this growing family divide is reinforcing this economic divide that we've been paying more and more attention to um, of late. And then finally, in terms of the larger ecological story, our country has been known for fostering kind of the American dream, the idea that it doesn't really matter where you start in life, that if you kind of work hard and play by the rules, you can make it in America. That's kind of the dream that America has prided itself on uh, fostering or fulfilling. Um, and so Raj Chetty, who's a, an economist at Harvard University, has been kind of been assessing what are the factors at the community level that are more likely to foster um, the American dream in, in reality. And in particular, looking at what promotes mobility over a lifetime for poor kids. And what he has found in his work is that in communities, the share of families headed by single mothers is a very powerful negative predictor of mobility for poor kids. And that one of the best metropolitan regions for mobility, again, is up there in that little picture, the Salt Lake City, in part because Salt Lake City has many more two-parent families than do many other metropolitan areas in the country. Okay. So what he's showing here in the scatter plot is that mobility is higher in regions of the country uh, for poor kids uh, where there are fewer single uh, mother families. So in his words, community family structure is, quote, the single strongest correlate of upper mobility, unquote, for the poor. And what's also interesting, too, about his work is that he's finding that kids who are from both single-parent homes and two-parent homes are more likely to experience mobility in a positive direction if they're living in a community with lots of two-parent families. So again, this, the point here is, is that what happens in our homes matters not just for us and for our kids, but for our neighbors 
and their kids. That's sort of the takeaway here from Raj Chetty's work at, at, at Harvard University. And then kind of putting all this together, we, we looked at a couple of outcomes in this newest report that we did last week. And we did a simulation where we kind of looked at other things being equal. If states enjoyed 19 levels of married parenthood across the US, what would that do to their per capita GDP, to their child poverty rates, and to their family median incomes? And what we found is that the per capita GDP would be about 4% higher, which is a pretty a big effect. Child poverty would be about 17% lower in our states. And family median income would be about 10% higher than it currently is. So these are pretty, pretty powerful, pretty strong effects for one particular variable um, in our models and in the larger society. So the bottom line here is that if you care about poverty, if you care about income inequality, if you care about the health of the American dream, you should care about what's happening to marriage uh, in America. And I want to conclude here by returning to Pope Francis um, and to one of his observations about um, really the connection here, again, between social justice and uh, the family. And he says, as you, can, as you can see here, that, quote, evidence is mounting that the decline of the marriage culture is associated with increased poverty and a host of other social ills, disproportionately affecting women, children, and the elderly. It is always they who suffer the most in this crisis, unquote. So given this, what, what can we do? And I'm happy to talk about these ideas in greater detail after, you know, after the talk and Q&A. Well, I think given the importance of marriage for social justice, we need to renew the economic, the policy, the cultural, and the religious foundations of marriage for our day. And we should do all this knowing that strengthening marriage is a matter of fundamental justice for the least of these, and particularly for kids in poor working class communities across the nation who have been struggling of late um, under the burden of this retreat for marriage that's enveloping our country. Thank you. So if this interests you, this topic interests you, we've got a blog called Family Studies that has a lot of uh, different entries and studies that are put up on our website regularly. I'm also on Twitter at Wilcox um, NMP. So let me, let me answer your question. Um, so in terms of um, the research, there's, I'd say there's some academic disagreement about whether or not having both parents working, you know, say, part-time or full-time um, is better on average for kids than having one parent at home. Um, but there's also some pretty good evidence, too, to suggest that when a child's... You said it's better for children? For there's, there's, there's a debate among academics about whether or not it's better to have both parents in the workforce or to have one parent at home full-time. Um, where I think there's less debate is that there's, I think, an acknowledgement that for infants in the first year, um, having at least one caretaker there, you know, most of the time is, is best. And that spending more than 30 hours a week in, you know, non-parental care, usually non-maternal care, is a risk for kids, um, socially and emotionally. So, um, you know, that's, that's sort of what I would say in terms of the research on that question that you asked in the middle of the, the lecture. Yes. So I'm just saying, that in the, for the child's first year of life, Having a lot of time, usually with mom, is a good thing. And it's a good thing for the next 17 years also. <laughs> I think studies overwhelmingly. Yeah, I think having, well, and yeah, then the question too again is, so for that, um, I think it depends too on, it, we're usually here talking about the, the mother, kind of her, her disposition, the family's financial needs, all those kinds of things that are factor in. And it's important for us to acknowledge that today in America, most married mothers do not want to work full time. About 20% would say they would like to work full time. That means about 80% would say they don't want to work. The sort of the modal, the most popular option is part time work. And I would say that in most cases, if that was sort of, you know, the option, that'd be pretty good oftentimes for, but again, it's going to vary from, you know, from family to family to some extent. And from, you know, 
each parent's kind of dispositions and, and ideals and, and, and needs. So, yeah, so, right. I mean, I think, I think for progressives, there's such an investment in, um, what we call kind of expressive individualism in sociology, kind of this idea that you should live your life according to what makes you happy, what makes you fulfilled, um, and that you know, marriage is seen as kind of a hidebound institution driven by archaic norms. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's, it does necessarily restrict our freedom you know, to some extent. You know? So I think that's, that's at the root of a lot of progressive concerns about marriage. It's also, too, I think, rooted in a, in a sense that it's, it's still patriarchal, that it's still about the assertion of male authority in the family um, and the sub subjugation of women in the family. And that's, that's also driving some, I think, progressive animus towards marriage. I think what they don't acknowledge, though, today is that that concern seems to be much less tenable. So for instance, we now know, based upon some research at Columbia, that mothers, moms have a pretty big wage penalty that they tend to experience for obvious reasons. But that wage penalty now is bigger for women who are unmarried than it is for women who are married. And I would say it's probably because the married women are getting more, a lot more help from their husbands than women who are unmarried often on their own as single parents. So it's obviously e easier to juggle work and family as a mother, if you have a husband now in the picture helping out with the kids, uh, than having no one obviously in the picture helping out. Now to your second question, I mean, um, so one idea that we hear a lot about in the science is this idea of selection. That is that some of the outcomes that I've been talking about tonight are really driven by people's underlying characteristics. So the idea here is that some of the outcomes that we're talking about are driven by the fact that the kinds of people who are more responsible, who are maybe more intelligent, whatever, the types of people who are more likely to get married today and stay married. And that's surprising their kids are then more likely to be the kinds of kids who would be flourishing in our society. Um, and that, I think, is part of the story. Um, but what's interesting about sort of the broader ecological argument that I was making tonight is that doesn't really probably explain, you know, why a state like Utah or a metropolitan region like Salt Lake City is doing so much better than a state like um, North Carolina or a metropolitan area like Charlotte. So I'm just saying that sort of the ecological story suggests that there's something about having lots of married families in an area that in and of itself provides a certain level of social cohesion, social capital, et cetera, that we're down to the benefit of kids and adults in that community. Well, the ecological stuff that I've been talking about with Raj Chetty is certainly, I think, one good a piece of evidence on this score. But it's also, too, to get back to the other point about at the, sort of at the, at the individual level, we've also been seeing twin studies being done now. At, at UVA, Robert Emery, for instance, has done um, studies. And what he does is he looks at adult women who are twins. They're both married. And one of, one of the twins gets divorced and one does not, okay? And so, and he looks at fraternal twins and identical twins to sort of parse out the genetic story and is able to figure out kind of what extent the effects of divorce really are actually an artifact of underlying genetic traits associated with, you know, these women versus the effects of divorce itself. You're saying, how does maternal education affect kids? Correct. Yeah. Um, this is only one. Out, this is only one outcome, right? It's, this is just showing us that uh, moms who've got college degrees, of course, are more likely to have kids who, who graduate from college as well. So, um, and I think what we would, you know, <clears throat> today we would basically say that moms who are better educated tend to use more complex language with their children. Um, they tend to treat their kids in a more calm fashion. Um, they also are able to um, elicit resources in the, in the neighborhood and the community um, in terms of connecting their kids to 
uh, tutoring or sports or music in ways that are, you know, on average better than kids from um, homes with less education. So that's, you know, there's a sociological story there about how education is linked to these kind of an ethic of parental cultivation on the part of contemporary parents. Um, but I think it's, we have to be careful here to sort of distinguish between kind of things that are kind of of value, if you will, in our society, and things that might be, uh, I mean, certain could be a kind of um, expressions of affection, family t you know, ties, traditions, kind of a, a default um, desire to sort of live close to one's kin that might be playing out in working class and poor families in ways that um, could be, you know, sort of judged as better than what you see in better educated homes. So one, I'd say one thing that's striking about class is that people who are, who are less educated tend to sort of stay in the same area, stay close to their kin. Um, and you might judge that as a better thing than the mobility that many people who are college educated will experience over the course of their lives in terms of where they live, you know, how close they are to their kin. So does that make sense? Kind of by the standards of kind of a well-educated set, you know, well-educated mothers do better by their kids. You know, they read to their kids more often. You know, they involve their kids in lots of activities more often. You know, and their kids do better in society on things like college, you know, completion. But I think we have to be careful to not sort of underestimate the ways in which, in some important respects, kids who are growing up in poor working class communities, and especially with this one in the case, you know, 50 years ago when there weren't big class divides in these kinds of marriage patterns, I mean, they were kind of, they were and still are kind of living closer to their kin, and I think maybe give in certain ways, their kin um, more attention, more consideration than do many upper middle class Americans. Question, so the question is about same-sex marriage. Um, and what I would say is that uh, we've gotten about, probably about 60 psychological studies would generally suggest that there's kind of no effect. The problem with those studies is they're re relying typically on non-representative and small samples. Um, and so they're not, you know, worth that much um, from kind of a science perspective. We have some larger um, representative studies that are kind of clashing in terms of what they would say is happening with kids in same-sex households versus um, heterosexual households. And we don't really, I think, know kind of from a scientific perspective what the story there is until we have some good longitudinal, large-scale representative data. We don't have that yet. My own intuition here is that kids from same-sex families, once you have that kind of data, will look a lot like kids from step families. Because again, you have typically one parent who's a biological parent and one parent who is, a, who is a, basically a step parent. Um, and I think that you know, given the importance of you know, biology and that sense of kinship and connection, um, that those kids will, again, look probably a lot like kids from step families. That's what I suspect, but, you know, we'll have to wait some time to get that kind of research in, so.